we're going to be targeting probably about a well, 25 to 30 minutes of content and uh, give folks a couple minutes to ask questions. Um, you know, really uh, the driver behind this is uh, talking about mobile devices, obviously, and um, it's top of mind for a lot of organizations. So, so let's just jump right in. Um, I want to start off by saying this is a whole lot more fun for everybody if we uh, have this be as interactive as possible. Um, there is a Q&A uh, button. There are questions that you can shoot out, uh, shoot over to us. So I, I'd encourage you to do so. Um, I, I do not know everything about everything, though, so I will do my best to answer what I can and, um, you know, at least uh, and follow up if I don't have the answer today. So uh, please, let's make this as interactive as possible. I'll try to pay attention to the questions as they come in, uh, but it'll be a bit of a juggle uh, checking, uh, moving through the slides and checking some of the content. So I'll, I'll try to check that periodically, but I've definitely built in some time at the end. So a quick introduction to myself. I, um, I'm Matt Wilson. I head up core security and compliance practice. Um, I've been with core for just over seven years now. I am based uh, in the Philadelphia area. Um, you know, we work with clients from just about every vertical uh, with every kind of compliance security concern that, that anyone could possibly have, whether you're in financial or healthcare or, or um, you know, to a lesser extent, government. Um, but work with a lot of municipalities, um, work a lot with education. So um, we have the opportunity to, to work with quite a diverse set of clients, and uh, it helps, you know, really form uh, some of the content that we're going to be getting into today. Uh, quick overview of what we want to cover. Uh, I want to talk about some of the characteristics that make up the concept of, of mobile. Um, certainly there's some common challenges within mobile security. Some are inherent. Some are created by user behavior. Some are created by organizational behavior. Um, and then we're going to talk a bit more about how mobile devices can go wrong and uh, some of the breaches that have been in the news of late. Um, and you can't get around any conversation about mobile without talking about BYOD. Um, and then a bit about solving things, which is talking about mobile security policies um, and MDM solutions that you might um, either be evaluating or want to evaluate. We're going to talk through some at a high level. Um, but I do want to touch on what we're not going to cover today. Um, you know, our goal is to speak to as many folks as we can. Um, to have a message that, while it might be at a, at a high level, um, it's going to be useful. There's going to be some homework that we're going to get into uh, at the end that um, it's going to seem straightforward at first, but it's really a challenge. Again, I, I work with probably about 100 or so clients a year on, on active projects, and uh, some of the same themes seem to keep popping up. Um, and it's, it's not rocket science. These are um, some very straightforward things that a lot of organizations just aren't doing. Um, but we're not going to be doing a technical exploration of every MDM solution here. Um, you know, folks will have their preference, they'll have their preferred vendors, and, and, and that's fine. Um, I'm coming at it from a, a practical security nerd standpoint of if I'm presented the problem of securing the mobile endpoints in my organization, uh, what do I need to consider? Uh, what controls should I be aware of? And um, you know, we're not going to be getting into this is the solution you should buy in case A or case B. Um, every organizational situation is unique, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit, and, and hopefully I'll, uh, if you disagree with me, hopefully I'll win you over to, uh, to that way of thinking. So let's talk a bit about the history, though. Uh, to know where we're at, we've got to know where we've come from. Um, you know, phones started out as very simple devices. You could make a phone call at first, and then, wow, we had contacts with um, and then there is this concept of a, a PDA that emerged well, probably in the, the late 80s and throughout the 90s, and you saw multiple iterations of that um, with Palm uh, eventually winning, winning the lion's share of the market. Um, so people had two devices a lot of times. And for actually many years, uh, you would say a phone or a PDA when you're talking about mobile devices. And, and now the concept of a PDA has kind of gone totally uh, out, and it's replaced with the smartphone. Um, now we have apps, and we have instant messaging, and various forms of instant messaging, um, from 
apps like Facebook and that has its own instant messaging client to uh, enterprise applications like Cisco Jabber, Microsoft Link. Um, we're kind of connected everywhere and anywhere, uh, and that can be that can be a good thing. Um, but it certainly has evolved from even 10, 15 years ago um, from just a simple phone that could make calls. Uh, we're doing more and more of these end endpoints. Um, and there's really been a revolution in both the enterprise and probably driven mostly by the personal side of things. Um, end users uh, pretty much demand uh, certain features and functions. And, um, you know, the, the key one is ease of use. And then they want some integration and application, right? There's awareness. I can move um, this content from within this app over to here, right? I can. Um, get an email, open up a PDF um, or a Word document, and, and then edit that document now. And then they want to use abuse again. Um, and then they want the, the device, whatever they have at hand, uh, to do some kind of real work. And sometimes that's simply a, a phone, a smartphone. Uh, sometimes it is their tablet. Um, sometimes it is their full-on laptop, ultrabook, whatever it might be. Um, and then there's ease of use again, and uh, obviously I'm being a bit silly in, in terms of putting ease of use here in multiple times, but, but that is the recurring theme. That's the real driver behind the, the, this mobile revolution is no matter what we have um, in terms of the device, um, we got to be able to use it um, and, yes, get that real work done, but it's got to be easy. Otherwise, people won't do it. That's why they're trending away from, you know, the at least the perception of complicated um, full-on workstations and jumping right to, hey, I have this phone, I want to make a post on LinkedIn uh, or I'm on my tablet and I can do so. And guess what? All the data is synced up, right? And, and some of that has to do with the concept of cloud and, and other things going on. But there really has been a revolution um, at first in, on the personal side of things and then people are showing up to their enterprises and expecting some of the same features and functions and reaping some of the same benefits. But this places some demands on the business, right? Um, we have these end user demands. We have these business requirements. Um, and when you factor in the need to secure it all, whatever the definition of security is at your organization, um, no matter what, you're up against the potential for device loss or misuse. Um, these devices are going to run on untrusted networks. Um, you can do some things, and we'll get into that a little bit about what, you know, some, some configuration, configuration settings and what MDM might be, allow you to do. Uh, but at the end of the day, these are cellular networks that you don't control at a minimum. And then highly likely that there's a lot of um, 802.11 wireless networks. And then there's a whole idea of malware. Um, and that's something that a handful of years ago seemed a little bit um, unlikely or fairly unlikely. I mean, everyone knew it was, it was kind of theoretical. I'm sure it was happening years ago. I'm sure it's been happening since these devices first came about. But it started to become uh, real and recognized in the enterprise uh, only of late. Um, you know, you're seeing some of the significant security vendors come up with um, mobile device antivirus and things like that. And um, while I'd never recommend against a control uh, like antivirus, um, you have to weigh its capabilities against the costs and, uh, and costs not just in terms of uh, monetary costs, but costs in terms of performance and ease of use and, um, you know, business requirements again. Um, but one thing is clear, um, you know, these big data breaches, they're on the rise. Um, Target is 2013 at this point, uh, but Home Depot is still very fresh. And it just seems like every other day there's reports of yet another breach. Um, and as these mobile devices increase in complexity uh, and increase in capability, I should say, um, that's really going to increase the risk to our data because that's what these devices have that increasing capability to do, right? Manipulate access and manipulate our data. So let's talk about what actually mobile is. It used to be pretty cut and dry. Uh, but now we have these laptops, ultrabooks, smartphones, tablets, tablets now. Um, there's probably something uh, I'm missing. <laughs> uh, we've talked a little bit about some of the positives, but, um, you know, let's call them out. But the end user is highly available. Again, there's really, they're really easy to use. 
they're good enough. Um, you know, you're seeing, especially with something like, uh, you know, most organizations run on the Microsoft Office suite, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, you couldn't get um, IO, um, Word or Office um, really uh, to edit on your tablet or on iOS. You know, you might have had to have a certain version of a Microsoft um, OS. Um, but now you're seeing pretty much full-blown uh, Office suite available on just about any device across multiple OSs. Um, there's some gotchas with doing things with a, a, a touch interface versus a classic keyboard and mouse, but they're pretty usable. Um, and you're seeing that organizations uh, are customizing um, applications, creating their own applications, uh, extending some of the usage, extending the accessibility of their data. But then we have the flip side of that. You know, these things are really easy to use. The smaller we make these devices, although you can make the argument that uh, with the, the iPhone 6 Plus and, and some of the, the newer phones that have come out over the last year or so, you know, these devices seem to be getting larger again. Uh, for years it was the push to small, uh, push to become smaller. But, but they're no doubt easier to use. We're making things lighter, um, making things easier to store, and they're just going to get lost or taken. Um, they're more difficult but not impossible to control. Um, they don't always have some of the features that we might want, uh, including some security features. You, know, you have quite a bit of options if you want to talk about encryption on a, a true OS like Microsoft Windows or Mac OS or, or even in the Linux Unix world, um, but, but less so when you talk the mobile side of things. And inherently, you're relying on some kind of platform security. You're relying on that OS, um, in a sense, just like you would um, if it was, you know, full-blown Windows or Mac OS, um, but um, it, it's a bit different in the mobile world. So we have these challenges, and they're often pretty common struggles within our clients. Uh, again, there's there's some limited technical controls that we see. Folks are, if they, very rarely do I see a mobile policy, but if they do, um, it, it's not really enforced. Um, you know, it might call out some technical controls. Uh, if they do have that mobile policy, but it, it's not very strongly written, um, and it's loosely adhered to. Um, as you get into larger, you know, the, the larger enterprise, that might change a little bit, and, and certainly there's exceptions throughout um, all of our clients, again, across size and verticals. There, there are some folks that are really ahead of the game and have a really strong um, implementation, whether it's an MDM or, or some of the other things we'll talk about in a couple minutes, like Exchange Act, I think. Um, you know, some people are doing some really uh, great things, some really strong um, controls are in place, but um, a lot of times it, it is lacking. And there's options out there, and that's great. Um, options, uh, options mean variety, and variety means you get to make better decisions uh, by evaluating, you know, based on your needs. But Sometimes with all these options, whether you're going to control through the OS, again, through something like Exchange Access Sync or MDM, and then there's options within applications, how you configure it, uh, not just configuration of the MDM, but how you're configuring individual applications, like what you're going to allow on LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook or um, Dropbox. <clears throat> um, so those options are wonderful, but they leave a lot of room for error. And I'm saying all this and talking about mobile and trying to define mobile while recognizing that the whole idea of mobile is really, it's going to be evolving and changing even today, even over the next, you know, 12 to 18, 24 months. Um, you know, I think I mentioned earlier, you used to give everyone a laptop if you did that, um, and they just got workstation controls, right? Whatever we were doing on the workstation, that's what we do on the laptop. Well, you've seen kind of a mentality shift there that, well, now actually there's, um, you know, physical workstations aren't entirely going away, but more and more laptops seem to be out in the enterprise. And, you know, you're treating those laptops differently. You're putting encryption on, um, full disk encryption or encryption of certain devices. It's being built in, uh, sometimes at the hardware level. Um, you might be doing something like virtualization, whether it's through Citrix or VMware, uh, some kind of EDI type solution. Um, so the idea, again, of giving users power and allowing them to work anywhere, um, it, it's going to push uh, that idea of mobile. Um, and then, you know, smartphones and 
Um, they have MDM, um, some kind of limited security policy. That's today, but um, soon um, you're going to see it become pretty ubiquitous. Uh, I don't think we have a choice. Um, so, so just in the news, right, just over the last couple of months, uh, some of these, I don't know if they are really dated, but, um, you know, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield was uh, towards the end of last year. Um, Coke, uh, I think, was earlier this year. But this all has to do with stolen laptops, right? And these are mobile devices, highly mobile devices, kind of the, one of the original mobile devices. Um, in the Coke instance, it was personnel data. Um, for Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield, it was their um, their members or you know subscribers data, and, and that's nearly a million records. And, and I'm sure they haven't sorted through everything um, even as of today. And that was, I want to say, November or December of last year that that was reported. Um, you know, in Cedar Sinai, that was towards the end of August, so it was about a month or so old. But again, we're seeing these devices easy to walk away um, right now. We're thinking of things in terms of, um, you know, these laptops have 100-plus uh, gig hard drives or 300-plus gig hard drives or 500-plus gig hard drives. Wow, they can hold a lot of data. Um, but think about, you know, what's being released on some of the more popular phones and what's uh, available on SD and micro SD cards. You know, you're getting 32, 64, 100 gig plus on these devices. Um, so, again, the, the capability for the increasingly smaller devices to hold data um, it's there, um, so you, you don't. I don't. Couldn't find a smoking gun to say, look, mobile phone led to you know a million records breached. Uh, but we did. I think all indications are, are pointing that direction. Um, so again, is, is it more than just laptops? Um, for now, uh, it's laptops. But um, eventually, these breaches, you know, they're, they're going to. You're going to start seeing the influence that mobile devices can have. And then, you know, then over the last month, we had the iCloud, and we had uh, the data breach that I'm sure everyone at this point has heard about um, of celebrity photos. And, you know, it's, while you can't necessarily pin it on the mobile device itself, that would be unfair. It's not necessarily iOS's or, or even Apple's fault. Um, but I think it uh, shown some light on the idea that these mobile devices, where we're living our lives, we're showing where we are, um, what we're doing, um, you know, including personal photos, um, it's out there in the cloud in a lot of cases. Um, I wouldn't say not without our choice. We're probably aware, but maybe not 100% aware of what that really means. I'm sure some of the celebrities weren't sure what that meant. And it seems, you know, fairly easy at this point. Um, to, to compromise some accounts because of just the sheer number. There was probably 20-plus uh, celebrities were caught up in the breach and, and over a period of years. But, um, you know, that just goes to show that um, the cloud, mobile, they're, they're connected at the hip at this point. And you can't kind of take one or the other um, individually. You have to consider the idea of the cloud, how folks are using the cloud, how the enterprise is using the cloud. Um, and I think, again, as we have more data that lives out there and the connectivity of mobile devices uh, and the ubiquitousness of the mobile devices, you're going to start seeing uh, more and more reports that did actually uh, involve, uh, breach reports that did actually involve mobile devices. But then um, there's also BYOD to consider. That's often the debate at a lot of our client organizations. You know, um, should we do bring your own device? Um, we're scared of bringing your own device, uh, but we don't want to inherit some of the costs. Um, so real quick history on it. Um, the earliest references that seem to be made are to a, a 2005 paper uh, that was published just called BYOD, Bring Your Own Device. Um, and then somewhere around 2009, I think Intel did a, a webinar or a WebEx or uh, had some kind of publication that just noted the tendency of their own employees to really just show up with their own devices and connect them to the Intel network. Um, and ever since then, um, there's been other kind of m small milestones along the way, but we've just seen, again, the advancement of the phones, tablets, and, and now laptops, um, more and more at client sites, um, noticing that, you know, there might be a Mac, and it's, a, it's an all-Windows environment. There might be a handful of Macs. Uh, 
that used to be relegated just to the marketing department or um, if there was an, an RPR kind of group uh, within an organization, uh, certain business units might have tended towards MAC, but that tended to, again, be historical. Um, maybe it was in some parts of the education space where MAC had a lot of history. Uh, but it's pretty commonplace anymore to see a, a wide variety of devices, both in terms of smartphones and actual laptops. Um, but it's here, and it's here to stay, um, just like mobile devices in general. Um, you know, some organizations that, that we work with, like in, especially in healthcare, it's pretty hard for hospitals. Um, it's an interesting challenge for them. They, they have the, the talent, which is their doctors, um, and in some sense, uh, they, they have to appease them. Uh, they're employees, but they have a huge influence on organizational policy. Um, the doctors, being the talent, um, seem to end up dictating a lot of times um, to IT about a lot of things. And some of them, uh, in a lot of cases, are just saying, hey, I'm bringing my iPad. If you don't like it, uh, I'm going to go work for ABC Hospital down the street. Um, and that's some pretty compelling uh, it's pretty. That's a pretty, pretty compelling argument if it's a talented doctor that you want to retain, um, you know, and it shows the power that end users have, the influence that they have, um, and so in, in these cases, it's become de facto. Uh, it wasn't an organizational policy; it just kind of happened, um, and and those are some of the riskiest environments. Um, you know, it, it's one thing to say as an organization, you know, for years we've been paying for phones. And we're going to move away from that and move to a BYOD model. And here's how we're going to do it. Um, contrast that with the just show up de facto uh, solution. That means you never really had a plan. Um, these devices just kind of started trickling in. IT was probably configuring them to work to make certain power users happy. And then the idea of the power user um, expanded and expanded to include just about everyone because no one wanted to be left out. Um, and that's a tough cultural shift to make now. Um, now it's here. So um, we have even seen sometimes um, in some of our clients, IT is even aware that BYOD is going on. Um, we'll ask about, you know, their mobile security policy. We'll ask about um, do they have any kind of MDM solution. Um, and, and they might say, you know, no, no. And then we ask them, well, do you have any idea about how many users are, you know, can they connect to your exchange? Well, there's nothing technically stopping them from doing it, but we don't think they know how. Um, so that's security by obscurity. And um, believe me, if, uh, if that's the approach your organization has taken, um, I would discourage it because I guarantee you some users have figured some things out. They know how to look at Outlook settings. Uh, they will try it. They've been at other organizations, other companies, uh, where they've had uh, their phone set up, uh, and they want it, and, and they're going to make it happen. Um, so you need, you can't just kind of play ostrich and stick your head in the sand at this point. Um, go seek out uh, that awareness. Find out what's going on. Use tools that you have at your hand, like Exchange Active Sync, to understand who is connecting, how are they connecting, and do you even want to authorize that? Um, and, and I do also want to call out, you know, this isn't just me saying this. Um, in 2013, Gartner did a study uh, of CIOs and uh, BYOD usage uh, or, or that approach to mobile uh, it's on the rise, and despite the fact that um, during in the study, uh, a lot of CIOs express some significant concerns about security. Uh, so again, it's here and it's here to stay. So um, there are benefits. Uh, as a security nerd, I'm always going to uh, just be cautious. I'm not going to just say BYOD is wrong or inherently bad, but there um, there's still concerns that even I have. Uh, the benefits exist in terms of reduction of, you know, asset costs. You don't have to buy phones anymore. You don't have to pay monthly bill. Um, you can support more in user devices. And you just already have familiarity with the device. That's a huge win. Um, you don't have to do some kind of employee training anymore. Um, you're not kind of sticking a new interface on people that are not comfortable with. They get to use the, the interface that they are comfortable with. Um, and that helps morale. And morale is an important part of um, a lot of organizations, and it might be very important to your organization. Um, that's not to be overlooked. Uh, but again, uh, as a security nerd, there, there's going to be some, some real concern. Uh, keep in mind, uh, number one rule I learned long ago uh, when I first started getting into InfoSec 10 years ago, uh, physical security almost always wins. If you give a determined attacker physical access to the asset, 
uh, it's highly likely that that attacker uh, will be able to get some kind of access to the data on you. Not always. Uh, I shouldn't. I guess I should have caveated that always. But um, when you give folks physical access, um, you have to kind of treat it like it could be a dirty device or a dirty endpoint at that point and then on. Um, and, and really, then you have a maintenance nightmare. So you might have multiple versions of um, Android, might have multiple versions of iOS, multiple different platforms, whether it's the iPhone 4, 4S, 5, 5C, now the 6, um, all the Android, uh, everything there from your, your Google Nexus to your Samsungs to, you know, that it's, it's really, really muddy. Uh, and that puts a lot of strain on IT in some cases. Um, it's up to the organization to set that expectation that RIT will not be supporting you. And, and that works well, again, on paper. But in practice, when the CEO has an issue with his or her phone at 2 a.m., uh, guess who's dealing with it? The IT group. So um, you're, you're just, you can't overlook the fact that even if that's your, quote, policy to not support end users with DOIOD, you're going to end up doing it in some capacity. There's also the perception, not the reality, but perception among some users that, well, you know, it's my own device, so if I lose it, that's not really the company's business. Or if I let my child use my tablet, um, well, that's my business. It's my device, right? They, they own it. Um, so why wouldn't they just let their child or their friends uh, log into it or, you know, access it? Um, and that brings along with it potentially access to corporate email, corporate applications, um, things of that nature. And then there's, um, you know, the concept of data leakage. Um, and that can show up in a variety of ways, but mostly uh, think of it in terms of um, this, the cloud and applications that make data sharing so easy. Um, who's to say that an or a user wouldn't set up their personal Dropbox and move work files um, from their workstation to it so they can work from their tablet while they're vacationing in uh, Cancun? Um, it's very possible, and in fact, we've seen exactly that happen in a number of areas. Um, so you, you can't discount the threat of data leakage and the reality uh, within your organization that is probably happening. Um, so taking a balanced approach to BYOD, again, I, I don't want to be so negative to say it can never happen, but you need to conduct your own risk assessment. That's, there's no way around that. Um, we see organizations time and time again uh, kind of jump feet first or, or get drawn in again. Uh, you know, this is something over time that uh, some user 10 years ago brought in a device and, and now it's just everyone has devices, so there was no real plan to it. Um, but you need to, you know, soon, today, 2014, before the year's out, do your own mobile risk assessment. Look at your organization. Review the cost benefit. Um, map out all your risks and threats and vulnerabilities and, and map out your mitigating controls or safeguards. Um, it's, it's not a fun process in the sense that it does take a little bit of time, but this isn't something you've got to spend weeks on. This is something, you, that thought exercise you could probably do in a couple days um, while soliciting some input from other folks. It could even wrap up in a couple in a day. Um, but you'll see a recurring theme with some of my recommendations is, you know, in doing that risk assessment and looking at the cost benefit, uh, you're making a business decision, not an emotional decision. And you need to get support from senior management behind that decision. It does you no good to come to your own conclusion and not be able to enforce it throughout the environment. And, and resources exist. Don't go kind of start from scratch. Uh, one of the funny resources that I came across um, while I was um, you know, putting together this presentation was that the White House actually has a pretty comprehensive, at least in terms of uh, government land, um, pretty comprehensive uh, BYOD guidelines. Uh, I have it linked towards the end here uh, on the resources page, but uh, I was pretty surprised that the whitehouse.gov page had that, and it's actually pretty decent. So the, the point I'm trying to make is resources do exist. Go out there, use them. Um, so we're all concerned about mobile security. We're all concerned about breaches. So MDM is going to come save us, right? It's, um, that's the solution. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe for your organization. Um, I say maybe, again, not because I'm recommending against the control, but because no single control is a panacea. Uh, whether you're issuing your own devices or you're do, doing BYOD, um, just about every vendor is going to have something for you. Um, you can pick the top security vendors, and there's some other interesting players in the market 
that some folks might not be aware of, like SAP. Um, uh, so, you know, just know that there are plenty of solutions out there, um, and, and we'll get into a bit more on the solutions here in a minute. But outside of mobile device management, um, what can we do? Again, if you have zero dollars, zero, what can you do today? Well, at a minimum, work on your organizational policy and process. And there's at least three things involved and possibly others. But at a minimum, you're going to want to have a mobile device policy. You're going to want to make sure you have a social media policy. And you're going to want to make sure you do security awareness training. Uh, last month in August, um, I actually did a webinar on security awareness training, developing a program. Uh, that's also on Core BTS's YouTube page. Uh, we recorded that one. Sorry, I forgot to mention that we're, we are recording this and it will be up um, at the conclusion. Um, but, um, you know, that was last month. Please feel free to check that out. That might give you some more insights into, you know, security awareness programs. But um, back on target here. Um, Policy and process is a key element that is significantly lacking in a lot of organizations. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry about that. I uh, got dropped somehow, and uh, hopefully not too many people dropped off the WebEx. Um, not exactly sure what happened, but the phone call disconnected, and uh, hopefully everyone can hear me now. Just going to do a quick check of uh, participants to see. We do still have quite a few people on. It looks like I am uh, actually getting out to everyone. So, again, I apologize about that. Um, not exactly sure what happened. We'll just keep moving along. Um, trying to be respectful of uh, time here. <clears throat> so, um, you know, certainly have the policy defined. Um, those are words on paper. Those are relatively easy and cheap to produce. Just take some of your time. Uh, and then if you are an organization that uses Exchange, um, you've had for years Exchange Active Sync. It used to be just called Active Sync. Uh, you'll sometimes see it abbreviated with EAS. Um, it, it's probably built in to your tool set, and you, you may not even know it. Um, some a lot of IT admins do actually, you know, use this, are aware of it. Certainly folks in InfoSec uh, are, are usually pretty aware of it. Um, keep in mind, though, um, there's an increasingly useful feature set. I mean, there's 50 or so policies now. Originally, uh, there's probably only 20 or so going back a couple of years in versions of Exchange. Um, you, you do need to be on the later versions of Exchange in some instances to use some of the features. But they're not as robust as a comprehensive MDM solution. They're just not. Um, and one of the other kind of drawbacks is the device doesn't necessarily have to um, listen, if you will. It doesn't have to abide by the policy. There was kind of a famous um, bug or situation, if you will, when um, uh, a couple years ago with one of the releases of iOS, I want to say it was iOS 6 or iOS 5, um, it would report back to Exchange that it actually was enabling some of the encryption features, uh, even though it wouldn't actually do that. So um, it, it, there's no way to validate, no way for Exchange to validate, I should say, um, that the device truly is um, using some of the features in some cases. Um, and, and more recently, Microsoft uh, has Windows into. Um, there's more features and configuration options than, than Exchange Active Sync. Um, but really, it's not as prevalent in the enterprise. And, and the availability of that, um, there could be some licensing questions or concerns. Uh, just know that it is out there, and, and you might want to ask about it. 
it might give you, um, instead of, you know, spending some additional dollars, you might have access to it already and might get you some of the uh, features that, that you might want from a security respect on mobile devices. So when we talk about um, a mobile policy, I'm talking about administrative policy. Again, the, the words on paper. Um, you have to look at your existing security policies and culture. It's actually no good to just throw together a mobile policy if you don't have a strong security policy uh, for across your organization, a strong culture. Um, and if you're going to go out and find some examples, you know, we get asked all the time, can you give us an example policy for this or that? And and we don't for a couple of reasons that, that I won't bore everyone today with. But, um, you know, at the heart of it is a lot of companies will just copy, right? We'll find something that we kind of like. We'll partially read through 75% of it, agree with most of it, and just call it our policy. Um, that's okay, but that's not ideal. Um, so leverage what's publicly available, but adapt it to your environment. Don't just do a straight copy. Um, as, as obvious as that might sound, um, I've gotten really good at spotting policies um, that have been copied from the Internet over the years, and um, I, I see it all the time. Um, have realistic expectations about what that policy actually means and can do. I've been in a number of clients who had a written policy, and when I ask them about mobile devices and how they're securing it, they'll hand me, you know, um, you know, four, five, ten pages, whatever it is, um, of the mobile policy, or they'll show me their employee handbook, and they'll say, yep, this is how we're securing the mobile endpoint. That's great. It's great to have that written policy in place, but it's not a technical control. Yes, there's there might be threats of, um, you know, um, uh, some kind of damages or, or some kind of um, penalty to the employee, I should say, um, if they don't abide by the policy. But, but let's not kid ourselves. It's not a technical control. Um, and, again, a lot of folks on the phone or on the webinar today, it's going to be pretty obvious to you, but realize that that's not the thinking of some other senior management folks, right? If it's written and we tell them to do it, um, well, then the employees are doing it. We know that's not the case. Um, make sure you're considering the social aspects of mobile within your company. Um, are you a highly social organization? Is everyone doing Twitter and Facebook and that's part of the, the marketing and, or, or part of, again, just the culture? Um, consider that as you're writing your mobile policy. You might have to put some specific language in there. Or, or if you don't want there to be any social aspect, we have a number of banking clients that uh, really want to dissuade employees from, from participating uh, as a member of that organization or demonstrating that, you know, I work for ABC Bank. Uh, and making posts in certain, um, on certain social media. Um, maybe that's what you want to put in your policy. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, you need to treat all mobile devices, whether it's a smartphone or a tablet or a tablet or a laptop, it's an endpoint. The data is the data. No matter where it lives, I don't care as an attacker if it lives on a phone. Um, I'm going to get access to that phone or I'm going to consider that phone a potential target. And then think about how mobile devices are accessing your network. Is it through VPN? Well, I mean, maybe as a, a, a malicious actor, I get a hold of a, a mobile device, and because the password is 1111 to, to log into the device, it auto starts to VPN, and wow, I'm on your internal network now, and I can discover probably quite a bit about that internal network. And, and make sure in your policy that you're setting expectations with your employees and responsibilities. You know, you can't just say, um, Security is everyone's responsibility. That's true. But you need to assign specific responsibilities to your own staff and, and make clear expectations for your employees. Um, if you want some, some content, at a minimum, you need to have, um, from the administrative side, talk about things like acceptable use, um, talk about jailbreaking or rooting a device. Um, that's something that typically more technical end users are doing, but um, as there's YouTube and a million other ways to learn how to do anything anymore, um, you're finding, you know, 8, 9, 10, 12-year-old kids are doing it. So they might be doing it even for their parents. Um, require that employees are going to report a loss or a theft. As obvious as that sounds, I've worked with a number of clients who have found out months later, came to us because they had an incident, they didn't realize the device had been gone for some time. The employee simply didn't notify them. Uh, make sure you're addressing cloud applications. Dropbox, Google Drive, uh, OneDrive, um, there's, there's, you know, dozens, if not a hundred or so uh, cloud applications that can live 
uh, on, and those are just the legitimate ones that can live on these mobile devices. Um, make sure you're being clear to your employees um, that you have the ability and intent to remotely wipe the device. If that's something that you want, um, you know, if that's a capability you're going to have. Um, and integrate the concept of mobile security into the employee termination process. Again, we've worked with a number of clients, uh, one healthcare client in particular that had employees that were terminated and they weren't um, either getting their company, in one instance it was company issued phone, uh, hospital issued phone, and in another instance it was just, you know, BYOD situation. Um, they weren't making sure that they wiped the device. They might have turned off the account. That didn't necessarily remove the device. And it certainly didn't remove the device uh, from any backups that the person had made. Um, think about, you know, your own iPhone, if that's what you have. Well, you plug it into iTunes and it makes a backup or backs up to iCloud. That's the entire configuration. And in the Google world, there's, there's analogs um, to that across no matter what platform it is, whether you're on Android or uh, BlackBerry. Uh, there's almost always a way to back up your entire device and often to the cloud. Uh, from a technical respect, make sure you're writing in the policy that you're going to require a passcode, that you're setting a screen lockout time, that you're going to enable encryption. Um, some of these things are inherent to the device, um, and some of them aren't. Um, you know, on a, on a full-on laptop, you're not necessarily going to have encryption baked in. You might be able to enable it through something like Microsoft BitLocker. That might be something you do. Um, but if you're going to have that control, make sure you require it in policy. In terms of regulatory compliance, um, you know, this is a really still, I'll use the term muddy, it's, it's an area that there is, there's a lot of room for improvement. Know that HIPAA, PCI, SOX, GLBA, FERPA, NERPA, or uh, uh, FERC, NERC, FERPA, um, they were all written originally in a pre-mobile world. Um, so there's still a requirement for you as an organization to protect data, um, but it's, there's a little guidance around it. Um, there's a general lack of understanding. What does it actually mean? Um, you know, there's a lot of solutions out there that, that claim they're HIPAA compliant or PCI compliant. I, I, you know, who proves that? What, what's the vendor's proof of that? Um, that's, to me, simply maybe their interpretation of what the regulation is. There's no kind of stamp of approval uh, that I've seen that's been legitimate. So be weary of those claims, um, as obvious as that might sound in that case. Um, don't just take it the vendor at face value. Consider the data and how it's going to be used. Things like email and file sharing. You know, email is the, the number one. Uh, I pick on that all the time when we're having these conversations with our clients. And, and if there's a, a lack of concern about mobile, I just ask them, well, what do you guys email? You know, when you send email, what content could possibly be an email? Is it internal financial reports? Is it customer data? Um, is it an Excel file with credit card numbers? I've seen banks, I've seen big banks um, email directly, non unencrypted, um, a file uh, containing thousands of credit cards, and that's within the last year uh, to one of our clients. Um, and it was a large name brand bank that everyone would have known. Um, it, it's something that uh, that data now lives in that email system, and you can think that it's, you know, quote, secure. Uh, but it's only secure as the, the weakest password. Um, and if that password's on a device, um, I think, you know, it, it's obvious, there, right? So if you're considering MDM, um, almost anyone, whenever there's a solution in the technology space that they're considering, they'll, they'll go to the Gartner Magic Quadrant. And what was interesting about 2014 is Gartner kind of redefined mobile device management to be enterprise mobility management. And then they evaluated the solutions on the, the idea of a secure container, the ability to do content push to a device, and content access pull to a device. And again, the goal here today isn't to, to strip apart the, uh, the Gartner EMM report. Uh, certainly, you know, seek that out and read it. But I do want to give a nod to it because it's a good place to start the conversation. You know, what solutions exist? Everyone's going to kind of go here and get the roughly 10 or so solutions. Um, so, you know, the magic quadrant is on the upper right where we see, you know, the, the leaders in, in terms of Gartner of AirWatch, MobileIron, IBM, Citrix, good. Um, and then, uh, again, they have their, their scoring scale. And this is a, a great place if you're considering a, an MDM slash EMM solution, great place to start. But don't rely on one source. Um, you, you're going to set yourself up to misunderstand your own risks, not 
really flesh out your own requirements and possibly execute a failed implementation. Again, speaking from experience, we worked with a number of clients that have uh, gone down the solutions route, adopted an MDM or EMM solution, and, and it didn't go well. And it didn't go well because they didn't do the next couple of things that, that I'm going to talk through. Um, so evaluate what's best for your organization. Recognize that Gartner's criteria, while great and a great place to, again, to begin your evaluation, uh, their criteria might probably isn't going to match yours. Um, and here we'll all kind of call out the idea of emotional decisions again. You know, we like the new and shiny. If we've been using uh, Exchange Active Sync for years, well, um, you know, Citrix MDM must be better. Well, maybe it is, but don't just switch to something else because it is the new thing. And know that, you know, just because a brand name, because it's the most popular, or it's the most popular in, in your industry, um, it doesn't mean that's absolutely the right thing for, for your organization. It might turn out that way. Um, but just because the solution is the most popular doesn't mean it is necessarily the best for you. Um, so before you do anything, before you do, you know, even beyond just looking at that chart I showed you of the Gartner Magic Quadrant, um, you need to set a budget. Nobody seems to do this first, but it, it's kind of silly to me and a bit ridiculous to try to evaluate solutions when you don't know what the budget is for your organization. How do you know? Is it $5 a user? Is it $100 a user? Is it $1,000 a user that you would be willing to spend? Um, and how do you define that over the lifetime of the, the solution the solution cost? And make sure you calculate support costs and all that. No one start, seems to start with a budget. Uh, there's cost concerns, but no one says, this is what I'm willing to spend to get this level of uh, risk, um, risk reduction. Do that first. Define your budget. Then come up with an implementation timeline based on your needs and your organizational requirements. Do you have 20 other IT projects that need to be, that are high priority, that need to be done before the end of 2014? If that's the case for your organization, then now isn't the time to throw a 21st on that's going to go poorly. Push it out to a timeline that actually makes sense. And then define use cases for your users, thinking about considering how the technology is going to be used and how they're not going to use it. Will they find a way around it? Will they circumvent it? Will they avoid using it because they're not happy with the way we did it? Again, culture comes into play here. Um, so we've kind of done that precursor stuff. We're going to jump right into evaluating solutions. So start on paper. Start with that Gartner Magic Quadrant or whatever, you know, asking friends, asking other folks in your industry. Narrow your choices down. Define the specific features you need and whatever your preferred architecture is. And you're going to see ideas and concepts floated about walled garden and virtualization and whether it's something like Exchange Active Sync that's just kind of pushing some policies uh, that the OS abides by. Um, understand the, the pros and cons of each of those inherently. Um, and then come up with a weighted rubric. You know, weight that architecture and approach. Um, the features and functions. You might have to get really specific. Maybe you're in healthcare and you have a specific need um, to uh, protect PHI, or you need it to integrate with uh, your EMR, like an Epic or a Meditech or a Meden. Um, maybe one solution gets more points because it does, and does it or does it better? Uh, what's the vendor's position in the industry? The product roadmap. You know, is this an end life product? Uh, don't get burnt by buying something that sounds great today but doesn't have a future. And then obviously the implementation cost. But are you factoring in the maintenance and licensing costs? Are you factoring in the cost to your employees? Is it a quarter of a full-time employee, a half an FTE, a couple FTEs over every year? Make sure you're factoring that into your cost and weighting it. And then do a pilot. It's rare that I hear from my clients that they've done really comprehensive pilots. We've had a couple of great instances where, in some cases, we even help clients uh, do certain pilot projects. But, you know, get three to five solutions, a handful. Reach out to your vendors. Yes, you're going to have to deal with the marketing and the follow-up and the, the typical kind of sales stuff. Um, but it's your, in your best interest to go through, you know, go through that process um, and get a couple things identified. Then reach out to your internal user groups. Don't just select IT. Um, I see that happen a lot of times, too, where, <laughs> you know, IT is considered power users. And, um, uh, and, and they are, and they might do some very interesting things and have some interesting demands. 
but other user groups like finance or accounting or uh, you might have uh, if you're in the um, if you're in education you might have teachers or administrators uh, things like that you might have certain user groups that have different needs um, and, and I'll also throw into there senior management because um, in many many cases uh, senior management seems to um, have some exceptions um, you know they want certain things to work in a certain way and they don't want a lot of uh, security in their way, preventing that or adding additional steps. Uh, make sure you're considering that because if you implement a solution that your users aren't really going to buy into, uh, you wasted your time and, and, and some of the money that the organization has. So getting towards wrapping up here, I realize uh, I've gone a couple minutes over, so uh, or at least my target. Um, you know, whether or not you've implemented BYOD, any kind of MDM, or if you've just ignored the idea of mobile completely, today, in the next week, go out and talk to your end users. Understand how they are today or want to be using their mobile devices within your business. That's going to be an invaluable information for you because that's some insight into they might be doing it today just without your knowledge or they might be thinking about doing something new and interesting. Um, maybe it is better for the business. You need to account for that in whether you're an IT or an InfoSec role understand your end users. And then I also want you to describe whatever critical, sensitive, or any regulated data that you have. Um, think about PHI, uh, cardholder data, um, you know, any other PII that might, you know, whether you're talking about various state breach laws or within a certain industry. Uh, and think about how it could end up on mobile devices. You know, kind of walk through, is it in email? Is it in Dropbox? Um, it's eye-opening to go through that exercise, and it doesn't take you a lot of time. That, that might only take you five or ten minutes to come up with that. Um, and then define what controls you currently have to protect that data while it's on mobile devices. Do you have laptops that have full disk encryption? You know, do you have Exchange Active Sync? Are you using it? A lot of times uh, folks will have Exchange Active Sync, but have one or two policies applied that they're pushing. Um, Look at all the capabilities that it might bring and consider doing more. Do you have an MDM solution? Go through the same evaluation process. Look at your solution. Look at your controls and, and take a look. Just review if you're doing enough. Um, at least once a year you should be doing that exercise, but I'm, I'm strongly encouraging, encouraging you to do that today. So uh, to wrap some things up, mobile security isn't new. Uh, so I, I apologize if I seem late to the party here in terms of talking about mobile, um, but it's increasingly important and it's going to continue to increase in importance. Uh, come up with a, uh, and formalize, distribute a mobile policy, those words on paper, do it sooner rather than later. Um, with whatever money you have, do what you can. If all you have is exchange access, think that's fine. You have some tools at your disposal, use them. Um, if you can get resources and budget to do more, well then by all means, do more. But realize that the solutions, they're not a quick fix. They're just another layer in our security program. If you don't have a pretty comprehensive security program, um, you know, spending any significant amount of time in one area is going to be a waste of your time. Um, you're going to want to have a comprehensive program of which this mobile security piece just kind of slots in nicely. So uh, I did a bad job at monitoring questions along the way. I will uh, check out. I will check out any the Q and A section. I see a couple folks um, had uh, noted the lost sound earlier, and I apologize for that. Uh, so just checking the Q and A. I had a question about um, printing the slides. Um, I, I can certainly make this available. Again, it will be up on YouTube. Um, so um, you know, please feel free to reach out to anyone on the core side. We'll make sure we get you a PDF of the slides. Um, then I had another note about um, certificate-based authentication for our mobile applications. Um, this isn't always available with some cloud vendor apps like O365. So um, the question that came in is basically, as I'm reading it, okay, there we go. The question is, is this a realistic preference? So the question was, um, you know, this person's organization prefers to use certificate-based authentication for their, quote, enterprise mobile applications. Um, and the, the comment is, it's not always available with some cloud vendor applications like Office 365. Is this a realistic preference? Um, 
That's a very good question that I don't have a great answer to. I apologize for that, but, but I'll, I'll give you a shot. I'll give it what I can. So um, it's not realistic if, you're, if your organization has gone to O365 um, and you still have that preference or is considering going to it. Again, it's part of the risk calculation, right? It, and, and you should be doing that before you migrate to Office 365. Um, so I guess the way, the best way to answer that is certificate-based authentication is great. It's a great control. Um, and yes, some cloud applications uh, don't play well with that. Um, that's, it, it is, from a security perspective, um, it, it's a sound idea. But um, this is where the security versus usability trade-off um, might have to occur. Again, do the risk assessment. Look at what, that, what benefit it's bringing to your organization. Um, okay, I mean, a couple comments about uh, not hearing. <laughs> um, let's see. And I think that was all, I think that was the only questions that had come in. Um, we're right at about, um, you know, almost an hour here. Um, I'll hang on for another minute or two, but I did want to flash up those resources uh, that I had mentioned earlier. And um, my contact information. So if there are any questions or concerns, you know, please do feel free to reach out. Um, I'll give give questions another minute or two here. Uh, it doesn't look like uh, anyone has anything new in some time. But um, all right. Well, in any case, thank you everyone for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, we do these every month. Please know that next month um, we'll be running another webinar. Uh, from our security and compliance practice. I actually apologize if I forget off the top of my head the, the topic, but we do have it defined. Uh, please look for a, a mail about that, an email about that. And um, please do reach out to anyone on the core side uh, if, there, if, you, if there's any follow-up, anything we can shed some light on. And know that this recording will be up on uh, YouTube's, uh, or Core's, Core BTS's YouTube page uh, here probably another day or two. So thank you, everyone. Have a great day and a good rest of the week. Take care.